And that comes from Luke 19, and Julian's going to come and read that to us. And uh, then Lindsay's going to lead us in prayer. Thank you. Morning. So we'll start our reading, Luke chapter 19, at verse 11, the parable of the ten miners. While they were listening to this, he went on to tell them a parable because he was near Jerusalem, and the people thought that the kingdom of God was going to appear at once. He said, a man of noble birth went to a distant country to have himself appointed king and then to return. So he called 10 of his servants and gave them 10 miners. Put this money to work, he said, until I come back. But his subjects hated him 
and sent a delegation after him to say, we don't want this man to be our king. He was made king, however, and returned home. Then he sent for the servants to whom he had given the money in order to find out what they had gained with it. The first one came and said, Sir, your miner has earned ten more. Well done, my good servant, his master replied. Because you have been trustworthy in a very small matter, I will give you ten cities. The second came and said, Sir, your miner has earned five more. His master answered, You take charge of five cities. Then another servant came and said, Sir, here is your miner. I have kept it laid away in a piece of cloth. I was afraid of you because you are a hard man. You take out, you take out what you did not put in and reap what you did not sow. His master replied, I will judge you by your own words, you wicked servant. You knew, did you, that I am a hard man, taking out what I did not put in and reaping what I did not sow? Then why didn't you put my money on deposit so that when I come back, came back, I could have collected it with interest? Then he said to those standing by, Take his miner away from him and give it to the one who has ten miners. Sir, they said, he already has ten. He replied, I tell you that to everyone who has, has, more will be given. But as for the one who has nothing, even what they have will be taken away. But those enemies of mine who did not want me to be king over them, bring them here and kill them in front of me. Morning, everybody. Morning. Isn't it nice to be back in chapel? And today we're going to be thinking of our church family. So we know that part of our family isn't here um, they're watching with us at home or maybe um, watching at a later date. Or perhaps they just aren't able to, for various reasons, including the internet, but they're still able to watch a church service on the television. We think of all our church family and we thank um, the Lord for each other and the support that we can be and have been uh, to each other over this time when we've been more at home. So we pray um, for God's love for each one of us in all our individual needs. Some of us are struggling a bit financially and looking for, for work. Some of us are struggling perhaps a bit emotionally because we're not seeing each other or not seeing our friends and family. Or perhaps there's some ongoing physical problems. And we think um, particularly of uh, Dick and Yvonne at this time as well in that matter. Um, and also want to think of our extended family. There's um, relatives that we have that we not only haven't been able to see, but perhaps are uh, causing us concern, whether they're young or old. And also our extended family in the sense of Desborough. We just thank the Lord that Desborough Chapel have been able to open their doors this morning, as I believe St Andrews have as well. So... Um, um, I just want to read the verse that uh, Lydia's put for us there. So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I'm, I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. And that's from Isaiah. And just thinking again of um, Lydia giving this, we thank you for um, Sam and Graham and all those that have been working behind the scenes to uh, keep us uh, going, for Ali bringing us a message each time as well. So let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for our family, whether it's our physical family or our church family, Lord. Thank you for the support that we can be to each other because we have that union with each other because of your love and your mercy towards us that has brought us to you. Lord, help us to listen to you to, for prompts for perhaps to visit somebody or to phone somebody that's in need so that we can extend our care that way. And we pray for each of us that's concerned for a, a relative, a family member, or a church family member, Lord, that we would bring, this, bring them to you and ask for your strength and lay our burdens at your cross, Lord, so that you would deal with them. We thank you that we've been able to open last week and today. We thank you for the technical work that's gone on behind 
the scenes that enables us not only to be here but to stream as well and to record the services. We pray that it will be a witness to this village. Lord, we thank you for the skills that have been involved in that, but we also thank you for our young people, for the evidence of their hard work and their talents that you have given them in all these exam results and qualifications that have come out this week and last. We thank you for them and we pray for them as they go on to the next stage of their education or into work that they will trust you and look to you, particularly when times are difficult. Lord, we thank you for all that you've given us here in the church. May we be fully grateful for it. Amen. Amen. As we continue together, so I uh, just want to remind us that the church is not a building, but the people. And at this time, it's good to remind ourselves of this. So just a little video that uh, helps us just to uh, think about that. Thank you, Sam. As we're not allowed to sing at the moment, I thought it'd be good to recite a psalm together. The psalms are the uh, Bible's songbook and enables us to say uh, our praise to God. For some of us, these are troubling times. We do not know what the future holds. We are unsure of what is safe to do, and we have very mixed emotions. The psalms allow us to express these things to God. No doubt there are times when we wish we could fly away from, the trouble, from uh, things that trouble us. Yet we confirm our trust in God's salvation. We cast our cares on the one in whom we trust. So let's stand together and say Psalm 55 together. Hopefully the words will appear on the screen. So let's stand. Listen to my prayer, O God. Do not ignore my plea. Hear me and answer me. My thoughts trouble me, and I am distraught because of what my enemy is saying, because of the threats of the wicked, for they bring down suffering on me and assail me in their anger. My heart is in anguish within me. The terrors of death have fallen on me, Fear and trembling have beset me. Fear and trembling have beset me. Horror overwhelmed me. I said, Oh, that I had the wings of a dove. I would fly away and be at rest. I would flee far away and stay in the desert. Selah. I would hurry to my place of shelter, far from the tempest and storm. Wicked. Confound their words, for I see violence and strife in, every, in the city. Right. Destructive forces are at work in the city. 
Threats and lies never leave its streets. If an enemy were insulting me, I could endure it. If a foe were rising against me, I could hide. But it is you, a man like myself, my companion, my close friend, with whom I once enjoyed sweet fellowship at the house of God as we walked about the monks, the worshippers. Let death take my enemies by surprise. Let them go down alive to the realm of the dead, for evil finds lodging among them. As for me, I call to the God, and the Lord saves me. Evening, morning, and noon, I cry out in distress, and he hears my voice. He rescues me from the battle waged against me, even though many oppose me. God, who is enthroned from of old, who does not change, he will hear them and humble them, because they have no fear of God. Attacks his friends. He violates his covenant. He talk is smooth as butter, yet war is in his heart. His words are more soothing than oil, yet they are drawn swords. Cast your cares on the Lord, and he will sustain you. He will never let the righteous be shaken, but you, God, will bring down the wicked into the pit of decay. The bloodthirsty and deceitful will not live out half their days. But as for me, I trust in you. Please be seated. In our reading, we heard about uh, servants working for the king. What part do works play in salvation? I believe school starts next week. So in preparation, I would look to, like to do some maths with you this morning, all right? The following video, video puts salvation as a maths equation. Thank you, Sam. There you go, there's your maths lesson for the day. Do the maths. We are saved by faith alone, but faith on its own is never alone. What's that got to do with what we're talking about this morning? We're thinking about discipleship and using our gifts, or that's what I originally entitled this morning. Uh, as we go through, maybe you'll think that the title is actually wrong, but uh, let's uh, go through this anyway. Have you ever noticed that people see diff things differently? Have you ever noticed that you see something different to other people? Julian will sometimes say to me, did you notice somebody's shoes? And I'll say, what? What shoes? <laughs> they obviously had some on, but I didn't look at them. And everybody's looking at their shoes now, aren't they? And as they pass Julian, they're just checking they were okay. But, yeah. We look at things differently. If I was to ask you to stand in the foyer at the back of the chapel and look into the chapel you wouldn't see the sound desk. You see a lot of other things in the chapel, but you wouldn't see the sound desk because it's round the corner out of sight. Likewise, if you went and stood out in the back hall by the hatch, looked into the church, you wouldn't see me standing here, you wouldn't see the organ, you wouldn't see the things over in this corner because they're hidden. Scripture can be a bit like that. We interpret Scripture with our Western culture and traditions and see things differently sometimes from those that look at it from a different place. You'll understand what I'm getting at as we go through this morning. But just to recap for those who haven't been with us the past couple of weeks, uh, just that, that we've been thinking about uh, what it means to be wise and foolish disciples. In other words, discipleship in practice. 
Wise disciples put their faith into practice. As that video showed us, faith needs to be worked out. It needs to be put into practice. That's, uh, you know, so salvation produces works in us. Wise disciples putting things into practice, just like the wise builder. The wise builder who built his house upon the rock put what he heard into practice. It also means involving God in our plans, unlike the foolish farmer who didn't involve God in his plans and that night God demanded his soul of him. I thought this week was going to be about using our gifts wisely. The trouble with thought is he thought his toes were hanging out the edge of the bed so he got out, tucked them back in, back in again. Thought. I thought what I thought isn't quite as it turns out. If we take Matthew's version of this parable, then I would be on safer ground saying that this is about using our gifts wisely for God. But Luke tells us a very different parable in a very different setting. It is not the same parable as, Jesus, as uh, Matthew records in, Math, uh, in his gospel. Joel Green puts it like this. The question put forward by Jesus' parable is a pressing one. Those who abhor the, the nobleman and reject his claim to the throne, are they rebels or are they patriots? The slave who blew the whistle on the character and practices of the nobleman is his action noteworthy or blameworthy? Put another way, is Jesus really the heir apparent? Is this really the nature of God's imperial rule? And we are left to take sides. So as we come to think about this parable and what it might mean for us, verses 1 to 11 set the scene. The previous verses, you have the, uh, Zacchaeus beca- uh, being saved, which leads some uh, in the uh, crowd to ask whether the kingdom of God was coming right now. Is the kingdom of God coming now? That was the question that Jesus was answering with this parable. In response to this, Jesus uses recent history to make his point. Remember, Luke is an an historian. He checks his facts. He goes back and looks at things and checks his facts and writes his book as a history book. Luke 3 emphasizes this. If you go back to Luke 3, you'll find there's a governor and three tetrarchs. What's a tetrarch? A tetrarch is a ruler over a quarter. Tetra meaning four, so uh, each have a fourth of the kingdom. How did that come about? When Herod the Great died, so we're talking about Jesus' lifetime here, his history, what happened with him. When he died, Arcadius, his son, went to Rome to be crowned king. But things didn't go according to plan. Just before he went, there was an uprising in Jerusalem. It was at the time of the Passover, and he went out, with, uh, raised, uh, used the army, and killed 3,000 Jews. Is it any wonder that the Jews hated him when he killed 3,000 of them? He went off to Rome to be crowned king. The Jews sent a delegate of 50 people after him to say to Caesar, we do not want this man to reign over us. Can you start to see the picture that Jesus is painting? This is their recent history. When in Rome, the emperor did not grant Arcadius his wish. Instead, he split the kingdom into four. Arcadius got part. Herod Antipas got part. Who is his, uh, two, of his bro- uh, two of his brothers got part of the kingdom. Herod Antipas and Philip. And you'll read of those in the Gospels. 
and Licinius got the top part. So you have four kingdoms out of the one, which is why there were go governors and tetrarchs. What happened to Arcadius? Two years into his reign, Rome removed him and put a governor in place. And that governor eventually, eventually ended up as Pilate, whom we know. That is the behind the parable that Jesus is ta talking. So as Jesus spoke, so these things would be going through their mind. This is our history. This is what we know. This is what we have lived through. So what's the point that Jesus is making? I would suggest the point is this. You think the kingdom of God will come now? I would tell you that the world will continue as it has done. You thought the delegation would change things. It didn't. In fact, things got worse. Therefore, do not be surprised when evil triumphs. Just because Zacchaeus has been saved, it doesn't mean the end of unjust taxation. There will be others who come as unjust taxes, taking unjust taxes for Rome and for themselves. There will be others who replace them. The parable ends with, to all those who have more, more will be given. But from those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken away. And isn't that what we see in society today? The rich getting richer and the poor poorer. We sometimes ask, where is God in what is happening around us? Where is God in our situation? Jesus warns disciples, he warns those that are listening that that is how things will be. Until his kingdom comes in its fullness, the ways of the world will continue. There will be corruption there will be those who destroy others. Those who are in power, who impose their will. For want of a better word, sometimes are known as despots. And we continue to see it in the world at the moment. Is it all bleakness and sadness? I would suggest not. We need to put this parable into context. We need to look at the full context of it. What happens next? You've had Zacchaeus being saved. You've had the expectation of the kingdom of God coming right now. You've had Jesus saying, hold on a minute. It's not going to come now. Things will continue as they have done for a while yet. But what happens next? We have Jesus going up to Jericho, uh, up to Jerusalem. What we know as Palm Sunday. Jesus going to Jerusalem as king. The scene then changes to see Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. See your king coming to you riding on a donkey. How very different uh, that is to Arcadius. Jesus comes into Jerusalem, not in power and might, but in meekness and majesty. In this way, Jesus gives a very different picture of what his kingdom is like. It is not one of demands, but one of asking. It is not one of strife and rebellion, but of peace and fellowship. Jesus goes on to say, uh, as he goes into Jeru when he goes in Jerusalem, he says, "What do, um, if you had only known on this day what would bring you peace, and what would have brought peace? Submitting to the rule of Jesus Christ, submitting to the King who has authority to rule, but does not enforce His rule, does not enforce people to follow Him. The kingdom of God is made up of those who choose to follow Jesus Christ." as king, and then live it out. Live out what it means to own Jesus Christ as king. 
Luke 19 lays a very stark choice before us this morning. Who will we let reign over us? In today's society, the idea of kingship is not popular. We choose our leaders and then moan about what, they've, uh, what the ones we've elected uh, do and then uh, choose some more. We choose the, the one we think will give us what we want rather than what we need. Yet the Bible is very clear. We are not free to do as we please. We are either under the kingship of sin or under the kingship of God. We can choose who we will let rule over us. This parable sets out what it would be like living under the world's rule. There is the expectation that you will make money for the king and any rebellion will be put down. The king rules by fear and rewards are for those who are able to work the world's system to their advantage. And do remember what happened to Arcadius. He was removed from power within two years. That way of life will come to an end. What follows the parable sets out what it means to have Jesus as your king. It means being humble, living in peace, standing up against injustice, and ultimately being willing to surrender your life for the kingdom. The king gives his life for his citizens on the cross. And he says to us, come, follow me. The Bible is good at painting pictures. I don't know how many of you have read Revelation. But there's the picture in Revelation of the lion and the lamb. John is standing in heaven. And the angel says to him, Behold the lion of the tribe of Judah. And isn't that how we expect God to reign? Lion, he's the king of the beasts, isn't he? He's the one that reigns. That's how we expect God to act. The lion, the king of, of Judah. And I turned and I saw a lamb as if it had been slain. The kingdom of God, in all its power, shown in the lamb who was slain for us. God's kingdom, the kingdom of Jesus Christ, is a very different kingdom to the kingdom of the world. And we are called, asked to choose who we will serve, or to put it in the terms of the parable, who we will not let rule over us. The kingdom of God has come, yet it is not amongst, among those, uh, and yes, it is amongst those who submit to the king. Is it here in all its fullness? Not yet. But I trust something of the kingdom of God can be shown amongst us as we submit to the rule of Christ. So summing up, the wise and foolish disciples. If we are members of the kingdom, what sort of citizens are we? Are we foolish ones? Foolish disciples hear but do not respond. They plan without God and they live into the world's standards. Are we foolish disciples? Or are we wise disciples? Wise disciples hear and respond, include God in their plans, and reveal the kingdom of God and the rule of Christ in their lives. Do I reveal the rule of Christ in my life? And which king do we want to rule over us? Or Sorry, which king do we not want to rule over us? and therefore reject their ways. Amen. Our final hymn this morning is, I the Lord of sea and sky, I have heard my people cry. 
Uh, here I am, Lord. Is it I, Lord? I've heard you calling in the night. I will go, Lord, if you lead me. I will hold your people in my heart. Is that how we will act? Thank you.
Uh, firstly, just to remind you that um, we'll be taking up an offering next week for Faith Mission. Envelopes are in the back if you want to take an envelope or um, uh, if you want to do a bank transfer, mark uh, in the reference for mis uh, Faith Mission so that Helen knows that it's, uh, what it's for. Um, and uh, next week, it, uh, we have, did have it down as Back to School Sunday. Uh, the family service will be the week after. So it won't be next week, it will be the week after. Uh, partly because, uh, for lots of different reasons, but mainly because it makes it a lot easier for us to, uh, you know, the children will actually be back at school and it works better uh, in the calendar. So uh, it will be a normal service next Sunday. Let's end with a blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you as you place your faith in him. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you as you live out your faith by being gracious to one another. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace as you walk with your God, casting all your cares upon him. In Jesus' name, amen.